online family. It is awesome to have you worshiping with us. It is so good to worship Jesus. Now, I, I am so glad all of the ladies that are here, you're here because you make us look so much better. And if you weren't here with the number of ladies we've got at the women's retreat, it would be all guys. And we may be going, hoo, hoo, but it wouldn't be good. I, it would, it's, you're, you make it so much better. I'm glad you're here worshiping with us. Pastor Aaron, great worship today. Worship team, thank you for ministering. What an amazing, give them a nice hand. Thank you. Wow. And I, I apologize earlier in the worship. We, we had a little glitch. We, we've got a whole new system that we're using uh, for uh, our projection, and we're still getting some bugs worked out with it. So uh, your patience, your understanding, your, your graciousness is very much appreciated. Our team works so hard at, at doing this, and don't we appreciate all of our projection, our live streaming, our sound team. Give them a nice thank you. Our camera guys, it's so much appreciated. God bless you. Wow, we appreciate it. Father, I know you've got a word for us today. So I'm asking you to speak to us from your holy word. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus for the Holy Spirit to empower me to preach the word, to speak the word that is in your heart today, Father, in Jesus' holy name. May I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Would you turn with me to the book of 2 Kings? Chapter 6, we're going to begin reading at verse 8, and for those of you that maybe uh, do not have your word with you, um, we're going to have it up on the screen. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 6, beginning at verse 8. It reads like this. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there. Not just once or twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And he said to him, alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Assyrians came down to him, Elisha prayed, for the Lord, and said, strike these people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was, when he had come to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and they were inside Samaria. Mm. God, just bless the ministry of your word today in Jesus' name. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for blessing the reading of your word. 
Robert Mitchum, starring as Commander Pug Henry in the television series The Winds of War, closes the movie watching as one of his sons stationed on the Enterprise leaves Pearl Harbor after the harbor had been bombed. The commander hates the thought of the United States entering another war and the massive loss of life that it's going to cost. He also realizes that the ideology and the satanic ambition of Adolf Hitler leaves no choice. The war which the United States had been drawn into was for the very survival and the liberty of the freedom for mankind. And in that war, only one thing mattered, victory. Amen. The total defeat of the enemy. Amen. The movie closes with the commander praying a prayer. And this is the prayer he prayed as that movie closes. Oh, Lord, in a world so rich and lovely, why can your children find nothing better to do than to dig iron from the ground and to work it into vast, grotesque engines for blowing each other up? Is it because Abel's next-door neighbor was Cain? Is it because of my enemies make deadly engines that I must do it better or die? Maybe the vicious circle ends this time. Maybe not. Maybe it will take Christ's second coming to end it. Maybe it will never end. But it is 1941, and I know this. Until life is better, or the monster Hitler, the world cannot move another inch toward a more sane existence. There is nothing to do now but win the war. Dear ones, I'm concerned that many people are not aware or are not concerned with the fact that we are in a great spiritual war. Amen. The Holy Scripture teaches us that there are two kingdoms at war against one another on planet Earth. The kingdom of God, filled with love, and joy, and peace, and goodness, and life, and the kingdom of darkness, filled with lies, deceptions, distortions, hate, violence, wickedness, every form of evil. And death. Two opposing kingdoms at war on planet Earth. The Apostle Paul talked about this and he wrote to the church at Corinth in his second epistle. He said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down vain imaginations and every proud thing that exalts itself against the true knowledge of God. A war. A war. And we have weapons of war. But they're not the kind of weapons that we, that we use in a physical war. They're spiritual weapons, mighty through God. He talked about this also in his letter to the church at Ephesus in 
chapter 6, and he said it this way. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And having done all to stand, stand. For we wrestle not against principalities and powers. Or, excuse me, you do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And um, I don't know, something must be wrong with the internet because uh, I don't have my notes. So I will just go ahead and lay this aside. And... Uh, we're just going to trust Almighty God for the remainder of this message, right? Amen. So we're in a war. That war between light and darkness, between truth and error, between good and evil, between life and death was never more exemplified than on January 22nd, 2019, when Governor Cuomo of the state of New York signed the Reproduction Health Act, which for the first time in the history of this nation made legal not normal abortion. We weren't content enough to have already murdered 60 plus million babies in the womb it now became legal to take the life of a baby up to the moment of birth. Murdering a human being legally. What? Oh, the darkness. But, you know... Just two weeks ago, September 11th, Governor Newsom of California signed into law a new law that basically legalized pedophilia. That the level that darkness is getting to is extreme. We are in a war. We're in a war. And it is a war for the very survival of that which is good, that which is wholesome, the very life. Thank you, because I'm going to need that for some of my other notes. Thank you so much. My projection person brought me her cues and script. <laughs> I've got some things in here I want to read to you that are so important to this message for where we're going to see the war that's going on. Yeah. Folks, it is literally a war for the very liberty and freedom of the people that live inside the United States. It's not just a cultural war. It is a cultural war. But it is so much greater than that because what is happening is the powers of darkness is animating and, and empowering Men and women that have very evil desires and designs that are right out of the pit of darkness and right out of the kingdom of darkness. It's not just a war of morality. It has taken a whole nother step forward. And it began when the World Health Organization declared a false pandemic for the first time in the history of the world the entire world came under the control of one declaration and it was not just used to control them in regard to health issues. It was used to control the very life and flow of the human race. 
It was Satan's attempt to see how close we are to him raising up and empowering the man of sin, the son of perdition, and his globalistic government that will control all of mankind. And a man who will be, the scripture says, totally possessed, not just by a demon, but by Lucifer himself. And in that test run, make no mistake about it, it took the spiritual war to another level. Now it's not just a war of good and evil and a culture that is beginning to go deeper and deeper into darkness. It became a war between the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and and its very existence in the United States. Make no mistake of it. It is a war. This declaration was designed to specifically shut down the church. You say, what, what, what are you saying? Folks, you can go to Walmart and you can park next to one another. You can go into Walmart and be up and down the aisles next to another. You can do the same way as, as, as same thing at Safeway. You can do that at Bymart. You can do that at Home Depot. Oh, I know we had to stand in lines to get in because they were limiting the number of people getting in. But is anybody besides me noticed shoulder to shoulder? both reaching for something up on the shelf? Yeah. Nobody, I mean, it, it, but the church was not essential. And so the church had demands upon it that the rest of the community did not have upon it. Watch this. John MacArthur, who has been resisting that, and I'm sure that you've heard in some of the news about John MacArthur and Grace Community Church in L.A. and their struggle. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago some of the struggle that they've been facing with, with the city of L.A. and, and with this, the state of California. On September 13th, in, in his message, he listed the 16 mandates that were given to him by the city of L.A. Listen to these mandates. And I'm reading them word for word from his video. No indoor meetings at all. Pre-registration of persons who come on the church property. People only allowed on the property for scheduled events. Every person who comes on the property is to be screened and have their temperature taken at the entry. We all must maintain six feet of social distance at all times, everywhere, including the parking lot and the restrooms. Every other parking spot must be left vacant. Now, you notice these, aren't, these are not required in other places in the community. Marked pathways to maintain social distance, keeping people apart, monitored by staff monitors. So they had to appoint monitors to make sure this was happening. Everyone always wearing a mask. Restroom monitors maintaining six feet social distancing in the restrooms. And they had to change the seat covers after every person. Tape on the ground marking distance. Signs indicating these mandates and also full disclosure on social media. Restrooms are to be used during the services to minimize the rush. Wonder how that worked. No hymn books, no communion, no offering containers, no pew Bibles, no singing, no hugging, no handshakes. Disposable seat covers changed between services. Services have to be shortened. Try to make that one work at Living Faith Church. Based upon separation 
That's pretty funny. Based upon separation, we could only meet in the tent with a maximum of three to 400 people. The last one, anyone who comes in contact with someone outside their family for more than 15 minutes must self-quarantine for two weeks. Wow. Want to hear that last one again? Anyone who comes in contact with anyone outside their family for more than 15 minutes must self-quarantine for two weeks. Uh, some have felt that would, and, and, and I've heard it said, you know, John, well, at least you can meet outside. Why can't you, I mean, at least you can meet outside. Can you see how much of an encroachment this is into church? And, and, and how much now the state and the city is demanding control? Of the church. It's suppression. It's suppression. See this. uh, We've got to understand. The enemy has stepped up his warfare. And he now is directly attacking. To try and not just control the morals of the culture. But to remove the very influence of the church from the culture. And here's the reason, dear ones. The church is the living expression of the kingdom of God on planet Earth. And we are a direct threat to him. Except when the church hunkers down and goes, well, and they don't know who they are in Jesus. They don't know the authority that's been given to them in Jesus. They don't understand the power that they have against the forces of darkness. And they're living in fear. They're living in intimidation. And in that fear and that intimidation, they hunker down and they just hang on till Jesus comes. And they're not a threat to anything in the culture or in the kingdom of darkness. Because the enemy has, in fact, just nullified their authority and their power and made them a prisoner of war. And Almighty God says, wait a minute. Don't you understand? The weapons that I have given to you are not earthly. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Church, listen, we are in a war. And I I don't particularly like war. I'm not a war monger. But I'm going to tell you, I have said this. I said this at 9-11. I actually talked to a recruiter. I said, look, I know I'm older than dirt, but I'll go back into uniform. Do you need me? I think he kind of laughed at himself and thought, what are you doing, old man? But I'm telling you. Now, I have not rescinded the vow that I made October 30th, 1967, when I made a vow that I would defend this nation and our Constitution, even with death if necessary. Amen. And I've not changed that, and no one, no one rescinded it. But I want to tell you, I have made an even greater vow. I am in covenant with Almighty God. Jesus Christ is my Redeemer and my Savior. I am a member of the kingdom of Almighty God. And on my watch, I am not going to allow evil to continue and to perpetuate in our culture, not as long as I am breathing. I am going to fight against it, stand against it, war against it. I am going to be a life-giving member of the kingdom of Almighty God. Wow, this is, just, this is just one example. Listen to this news article that was on Fox, October 14th, 2014. Quote, the city of Houston has issued subpoenas 
demanding a group of pastors turn over any sermons dealing with homosexuality, gender identity. Anise Parker, the city's first openly lesbian mayor, and those, who minist- those ministers who failed to comply could be held in contempt of court. Now, she later dropped that out of pressure. But that was just a step. You think, well, okay, but that was, you know, that was six years ago. Well, how about the state of California? In 2018, April 2018, a bill was introduced to the state legislature to restrict how pastors and Christian institutions teach biblical morality, particularly regarding homosexuality. As if that wasn't enough, the California Assembly of Judicial Committee passed a resolution in June of 2019, just a year ago, requiring pastors to affirm homosexuality and to condemn conversion therapy. In other words, the attempt to try and help someone get delivered from the powers of darkness that are working in their life. We're in a spiritual war. This was, this was sent to me just, just uh, two days ago. Um, I forgot to bring my phone up with me. Would you please excuse me a second? It's an article, uh, an op-ed that was in the Huffington Post. And I, I got to read this to you because I, I don't think you'd believe it. If I didn't read it to you, quote, by the way, the title of the, of the editorial was Ging, Ginsburg's death pushed me to join the satanic temple. A 40-something attorney and mother who lives in a quiet neighborhood with a yard and a garage full of scooters and soccer balls has dedicated herself to the satanic temple in the wake of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death believing that they are the best force in America to keep abortion rights alive. Quote, I'm not the type of person who would normally consider becoming a Satanist, but these are not normal times, Jamie Smith says in the beginning of her bizarre and often strangely ironic uh, op-ed. According to Jamie Smith, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg left her Less with grief and more with fear. The fear that the religious right will rise again for another generation to transform every woman into a handmaid in service of the white male patriarchy. I fear that American citizens are inching closer to living in a theocracy or dictatorship and that the checks meant to prevent this from happening are close to eroding beyond repair. When Justice Ginsburg died, I knew immediately that Action was needed on a scale we have not seen before. Our democracy has become so fragile with the loss of one of the last guardians of common sense and decency in government. That says something about where her mind is at. Less than two months before a pivotal election has put our civil reproductive rights in danger like never before. I hope so. It's a spiritual war. And people are either going to run to Satan or they're going to run to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've been sharing with you about the civil war, uh, the the spiritual war that is going on across our culture. But I want to tell you the same kind of attack has increased on individual Christians. The amount of fear and intimidation that has gripped their heart, the, the spiritual attack that is going on in the lives of young people that are 45 and younger, the spiritual attack is immense. And what is greatly concerning to me is there are literally thousands of people that while the church hunkered down and was online only, as the churches are opening back up, they are not going back to church. They they are sliding somewhere in, in between 
and, and how easy it was to just do church in pajamas in your living room has caused a lukewarmness and a spiritual apathy that has crept in that is, is not being turned around. And that's a part of what makes what took place yesterday in our nation so very, very significant and important. I haven't heard the exact number, but when you look on those, on, on, on the, when they panned across the crowd that covered the mall in Washington, D.C., it had to be somewhere between 100 and 150,000 believers gathered for one purpose. They weren't listening to preaching. They weren't there to just listen to worship. They were there specifically to humble themselves, to repent, and to seek Almighty God. And if you didn't get to see it, I am, uh, you've got to get on YouTube and you've got to watch it. Now, it went from 6 in the morning our time until uh, 3 in the afternoon, 2 in the afternoon, 3 in the afternoon, something like that. And, and I watched the whole thing. I got to tell you, the whole time I was nothing but praying in the Holy Spirit. But dear ones, we must see, we must see an awakening. And, and, and what, what took place was incredibly significant for you and I. Now this, this story I read to you out of 2 Kings illustrates for us what we need to be doing. Because what was happening here was the armies of Assyria, the king of Assyria, was going, I'm going to conquer the people of God. And so he was making forays into the northern ten tribes of Israel. But what Almighty God was doing was when he would, when it talked about the king of Syria, what he was talking about in his bedroom, the Hebrew word there was actually for a little room that was common for kings to have at that time, a separate little room that they would go into that little room and they would make their secret plans with just their closest, closest confidence. They would make their plans and then come out and execute those plans. And what it's talking about is when the king would go in to his little chamber and he would make his secret plans, Holy Spirit would then tell the prophet Elisha what was going on, and Elisha would then send a messenger to the king of Israel and say, don't go here because the king of Assyria is going to be there. And they were avoiding, they were avoiding the attacks and, and literally thwarting the attacks of the kings of Assyria. Now, the first thing God wants you and I to understand is we have been so vulnerable in this nation to the powers of darkness because the church has been busy with entertainment and been busy with just, just uh, fitting into the culture instead of seeking Almighty God to have Holy Spirit power so that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were at work so that Holy Spirit could reveal to the church the plans and strategies of the enemy so the church could rise up and thwart the powers of darkness. Amen. We hunkered down. How else can you explain in the 1960s prayer and Bible reading being taken out of the schools? Where was the church? I know where I was. I was still a sinner. I hadn't come to Jesus yet. How about 1973? I will never forget in 1973 when... It's just a young man. I was in my early 20s, mid-20s, pastoring, planting a church actually in Bramley, Ontario, and uh, the, the hospital near us, Brampton General Hospital, asked me to sit on a committee because they were going to make the decision, would they or would they not permit abortions in that hospital? And I was the only pastor sitting on that committee. Had medical doctors, had some lawyers, had some other community leaders. And here I was, lone pastor. The discussion went on and looked at me and said, uh, what is your denomination saying? And I had to swallow hard and let them know. 
And at that point, our denomination had not made a statement yet. Roe v. Wade had been passed. But our, our movement had not yet made, and it, we weren't alone. So I'm not like just picking on the church of God. Because the overwhelming majority of churches in the nation had not yet made any kind of a statement. The church was silent. 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 How, how sad that we're silent. Dear ones, the time must stop. We must rise up. Boy, it is so quiet in this room right now. We're not getting any amens. Online family, I'm sure you're just as quiet because I know this, this is a very, very pointed. I, I told the prayer team, I've got one of the most important messages I've brought in a long time to the family to get us ready for where we're going. Over the next many weeks, clear up through Christmas time, we're going to be talking about this we believe. At Christmas time, we're going to talk about what do we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? Who is he? Who is he? Between now and then, we've got to talk about what do we, what do we believe in this, in this culture of darkness when distortion is, the, is, the, is, the, 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 is it going throughout the land. We're distorting our history. We're distorting world history. We're distorting human sexuality. We're distorting what is right, what is wrong. We're beginning to call evil good. We're calling good evil. We're seeing all of this distortion. It is time. There has to be some people that rise up that know truth, that know the body of truth and will stand for the truth and will live by the truth. Amen? Amen. But in the meantime, we are going to be challenged at the core of our own heart. There are some of you in this room, you have been struggling and battling with spiritual attack. You have been struggling with your own thoughts. What will I and will I not allow into my life? How much alcohol will I allow? How much marijuana will I allow? How much porno will I allow in my life? Am I just going to allow the pop culture soft porno? And so the gals, they're not totally naked. They're just wearing see-through stuff. How much porno am I going to allow? How much am I going to allow the enemy to beat up my family? Am I going to allow anger and frustration to continually cause our home to be a yelling place? Am I going to allow the enemy to continue to torment me with my past so I'm living under condemnation? Am I going to continue to be a Christian that is hunkered down in fear and intimidation and I'm constantly struggling with fear? I'm constantly struggling with depression. I'm constantly struggling with anxiety. I'm constantly struggling with condemnation. Am I going to allow the bitterness that I have lived with all these years over divorce, over having been rejected, over not being loved as a child, am I going to allow that bitterness to continue on year after year after year? Or is it time for me to stand up as a child of God and say, I am redeemed. I am a new believer. I, not just a new believer. I'm a whole new creation in Jesus Christ. And I am going to rise up and I am going to live in the victory with which Christ has made me free. It is for freedom that Christ made you free. He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Dear ones, it is time for us to rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit and say enough. Amen. I apologize. I've been yelling at you for the last five minutes. I, I, I just, I watch believers who do not know who they are in Jesus, and so they're hunkered down. But I've got to tell you what concerns me equally as much, and that is 
the number of Christians that are living with a Laodicean spirit. They still believe in Jesus. They still have their salvation. They're going to heaven, but they are so cold in their walk in the Holy Spirit, and they are completely content to go week after week with coming to church when it's convenient. When it's convenient. I'm going to tell you something. What are you going to do if we keep going this way and the government now says no church whatsoever? What are you going to do? I mean, I tell you, I've had some daggers thrown at me through the eyes of some folks because we meet. How come we're not hunkered down? How come you're, how come you're gathering? How come you're not putting a limit? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The reason is because I am not going to let the kingdom of darkness dictate to Living Faith Church how we do church. No way. No way. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Not Governor Brown. Not Governor Newsom. Not Governor Inslee. And God forbid if our United States government should go that way. They don't either. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. But I am greatly concerned that the church in America would gladly comply. And our brothers and sisters in Iran, in China, in many of the nations in, on the African continent... They would look and they would watch the Christian church in America gladly obeying and hunkering down and letting the devil dictate what we do instead of realizing they literally put their life on the line every day to go to church and to worship with other believers. I want to ask you, will you? Will you put your life on the line? Do you have enough power of the Holy Spirit inside of you that if the enemy was trying to literally say to you, It is don't go to church or death. What would you do? So we're we're, we're facing that right now. And in your own heart, in your own life, you have to ask yourself, how much of the power of darkness am I going to allow to control my life? It's all about that right there. So Syria went, we got to get rid of that prophet. We got we, we to get rid of that prophet. So he sent an army after the prophet. This is so cool. <laughs> Satan trying to destroy a prophet of God. That, that's a joke right there. Yeah. Yeah. Elisha's assistant went out that morning. We're not told what he was going out for, but he went out that morning, and suddenly he saw the army of Assyria completely surrounding the city where they lived. Actually, it was more like a village. And he came running back into Elisha and says, we're completely surrounded by the enemy. What are we going to do now? (laughs) Completely unruffled. Elisha said, wait a minute. You're looking with natural eyes. Go back out and look with your spiritual eyes. He prayed for a spiritual eyes to be open. He went back out. He looked, and he saw that the army of Syria was surrounded by an army of angels with chariots of fire. See, dear ones, when the church, when the church gets lukewarm and cold like we are, we're spiritually blind. We can't see what God sees. We can't hear what God is saying because our our eyes are blinded spiritually and our spiritual ears are not hearing well. 
And Almighty God wants us to be on fire with the Holy Spirit so we can see with the spiritual eye and we can hear with the spiritual ear. I want to tell you something. I believe with all my heart, and I've been praying for this. You've been praying for this. We've been crying out for it. And I'm going to tell you what happened on the mall yesterday. We are seeing a synergy, a Holy Spirit synergy being birthed in this nation right now. And all we got to do is just step into what Holy Spirit is doing. And I'm telling you, we do not live in fear. We don't fear C-19. We don't fear our governor. We don't fear this other stuff that is going on. But what we fear is we fear Almighty God. And when we walk in the fear of Almighty God, we get to see things that no one else gets to see. It's there. It's there. See, it's there. there there's, I, I, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know hardly anything about him. But this guy that's going to all the cities that have been having these riots and stuff, and he's been leading these worship and praise gatherings, and thousands have been gathering. There's been baptisms and stuff going on. I mean, God has just been moving. I'm watching that happen and then I watched what happened yesterday on the mall in Washington, D.C., and with Franklin Graham leading the prayer march, and I'm just going, Almighty God, you're doing it again. Okay, okay, put a, put a pause in that for a second because I want to show you something even greater spiritually. And some of you, you're so connected carnally, you're only going to hear it in the natural, and you're going to think it's political. It is not. I do not believe it was a coincidence that, that President Trump changed the day and time he was going to announce his nominee for the Supreme Court from Friday to 5 o'clock on Saturday. That was, that was the closing time of the return. The time of prayer and fasting and seeking God in the mall. I don't think it was a coincidence that he changed that. Because originally he was going to announce it on Friday. And he changed it to 5 o'clock on Saturday. I don't think that was a coincidence. And then... Who he announced, Justice Barrett. Do you know about her? Now, already they've started, the media is already starting to tell lies. I, I was researching for her. It took me five pages on Google to get past all of the negativity. To get to an accurate historical record of her. She's a very, a very committed Roman Catholic. But that's not all. Okay? She, she graduated from the School of Law at Notre Dame and was a professor at, uh, in, in, uh, in that school at, uh, in, the, in the law department of, of Notre Dame until she was appointed in 2017 by President Trump to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Okay? But what you also need to know about her is she is not just religious in form and activity, but for some time she has been a member of the People of Praise now, the media is going to tell you that is a secret cult. Well, first of all, there's nothing secret about it. It's been around since 1971. It is, it is an organization that was birthed out of, directly out of the charismatic renewal. And it's made up of Roman Catholics, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Pentecostals. And it is, it, is a, it is a group of people that gather together to worship the Lord and to serve communities. They all happen to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues. 
Now listen, I do not believe it is a coincidence that our president has selected a brilliant, stunningly brilliant woman who is committed to our Constitution, who served 20 years ago under one of our really constitutionalist members of the Supreme Court and has now been appointed to replace or nominated to replace one of our most liberal judges. Our president selected a born-again, Holy Spirit-baptized, tongue-talking, Roman Catholic woman to serve on our Supreme Court. You don't think that's not a spiritual thing? I think that is a deeply spiritual thing. But it's going to be a spiritual war to get her there. You better go to prayer. You better go to prayer. Listen to me, folks. Listen, listen. It, it is time for God's people to stop looking at themselves as either being an elephant or a donkey. Or a green party or a purple party. It is time for the church of Almighty God to say we are in a cultural war between good and evil. And it's going to decide whether I am going to side with those who call evil good and good evil or whether I am going to side with those who say evil is still evil, good is still good, and we're gonna, and 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 we're gonna we're gonna support the church. One side that says we gotta shut the church down; it's non-essential. The other side says, no, 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 the church is essential. We got We gotta support the church. It, it it is that black and white. It is a spiritual war after your soul. Will you live in the liberty and freedom with which Jesus Christ has set you free? And it is time for the men and women of God to stop themselves and become very intentional of looking at their own life and saying, if I walk in the light as he is in the light, I have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. But how much I walk in the light is in direct ratio to how much of the kingdom of darkness I allow into my life. Whether I am talking a spirit of fear, whether I am talking a spirit of depression, whether I'm talking a spirit of bitterness, whether I am talking about, about just constantly walking in, in intimidation and fear of man, or whether I'm talking about a stronghold of pornography, a stronghold of alcohol, a stronghold of narcotics, a stronghold of other kinds from the power of darkness. Uh, how much darkness am I allowing in my life? Because as a child of God, I've got to walk in the light as he is in the light because then I live free. That word that was just shared is right out of heaven. Amen. Because the third thing is, it is time to rise up and go to war. Amen. And we got to win that war in our own heart first. What I was just talking about. And then we got to be an army that goes out and brings the love of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? You have got to win the war in your own heart. The life-giving church 
the life-giving church is a church that has won the war in their own heart against the power of darkness. That doesn't mean you're not going to be attacked more. Of course you are. The enemy doesn't give up easy, and the enemy doesn't quit. I had one young man look at me one time, and he said, well, pastor, you know, you're, you're 70 years old, and so you probably don't have to deal with this, but man, I'm struggling with, with temptation sexually. I looked at him and said, who told you that lie? You think just because I'm 70, the way, the way that women undress today isn't a temptation? I battle it. I just, I just have, have won the battle with my eyes, and I keep them under control. And, I, and I, I won the battle here, and I keep my thoughts under control. Amen. As I was sharing with, with someone yesterday, there's times when I get a real massive dose, like in Walmart one day when I was heading down the aisle, and this woman came around the corner. She had almost nothing on. I immediately turned my cart around, and I ran, and I found Wanda, who was in the grocery section. I said, you are not going to believe what I just saw. And I told her in detail. She went, yuck. I said, I agree, yuck. But I immediately got that stuff out of my brain so I could live in victory. But as a young man, I didn't do that. I filled it with porno. And when I got born again, I had to drive that stuff out, and I had to win that battle for my mind and my emotions and my eyes. Have you, sir, have you won that battle yet? You've got to, because the enemy will use it to keep you defeated in your walk in the kingdom of God. Sister, have you won it? I, I didn't think I would ever see the day. The, the, the 30 some years that Juan and I did abuse counseling for abuse victims, I would never have dreamed the day would come that women would fight pornography because it just, it just wasn't there. And it is so contrary to the hardwiring of a woman. But the enemy of darkness has so sexualized this culture, women battle it. Are you free? Sis, are you free? Are you free from bitterness? That is a cancer that will absolutely destroy you. Are you free? Are you living free? Are you free in the freedom that Christ sets free? If you'd say, Pastor Dean, I want prayer because I'm not free like I need to be free. I want to pray for you. Slip out from where you are quickly. Come down here. I want to pray for you. Just slip out from where you are. Sir, come on. Come get free. Sis, come on. Come get free. Come get free. I want to be free. Do not wait another minute. Come on. Come on. Come quickly. Come quickly. I know all over this room there are people. You are in a war because God showed me in prayer this morning what a war you're involved in. God wants you free. Step out from where you are. Come on, brother. Don't be afraid to come forward. Come on, brother. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus said these words. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then the scripture goes on to say, he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And then it goes on to say in Galatians, it said, stand fast in the liberty with which Christ has made you free. Almighty God wants us living in freedom. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to pray for you. I'm waiting to pray for you because Jesus wants you free. Jesus wants you free. Do not let the people that you've come with hold you back. Don't fear them. Step out from where you are. Let Jesus make you free. Let Jesus make you free. Let Jesus make you free. Mmm. 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 Mm. 
there is someone here and you have been living with physical pain tormenting you. It torments you day and night. Physical pain. It torments you. And you have been self-medicating and it's not working. And you live in that pain. And the enemy is using that pain to torment you. He says to you, God doesn't love you. If God really loved you, he wouldn't let you live in this pain like you are. The enemy is using that pain to torment you that you're not good enough. That, and, and maybe you're not really born again. Maybe you're not really going to heaven. And you've even had thoughts. You know what? If God really loved me, he wouldn't let me live in this pain. I'm just going to walk away. I'm just going to walk away. And it's the enemy's lies. It is the enemy using that torment to torture you. That physical pain to torture you. And to sow lies into your mind and into your emotion. And I am saying to you, that is not of God. That is the enemy. Let me pray for you. Almighty God will give you a victory today. Come on. Come on. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Almighty God. Almighty God. Almighty God. Almighty God. Almighty God. I'm, I'm extending this, this altar call because Holy Spirit is still working in hearts. And he wants you free. He wants you free. He wants you free. I need the pastoral staff to come help me pray for people. I need some deacons to help also. Please step out from where you are. Come help pray. Almighty God. 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 Online, online family. Listen to me, online family. Right where you're at, Jesus wants to touch you by his mighty power. I'm going to pray for you right now, and the Holy Spirit is going to touch you with his power right now, right where you are. Let the power of Almighty God, I'm going to ask you, if you're driving right now, pull over to the side of the road. If you're, if you're in your living room, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. Just lift your hands with me right now to Jesus. In the authority of Jesus' name, the power of Almighty God touching and setting free that bondage of bitterness broken in the authority of Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, the hate to be washed out of the heart right now in the name of Jesus. 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 The power of addiction broken right now in the name of Jesus. That physical addiction broken. The emotional addiction broken. The mental addiction broken in the authority of Jesus' name. Be free. Yes. Almighty God sets you free in Jesus' name. Online family, I'm going to ask you in the comments. Would you just mention the comments? I was set free. I was set free. Just, just mention the comments, would you please? I was set free. I want to know. If you gave your life to Jesus, you came back to Jesus, mark that in the comments as well. I want to pray for you, and I want to send you a note this week. God bless you. God bless you. Those that are in the altar here, all the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is ministering in a mighty way right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, up and, down, up and down this altar, the power of Almighty God is so strong. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, the mighty power of Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah.
shaken. I will put my trust in you alone. Thank you, Lord. 